welcome all of you for this uh, most important session on governance, organization, and institution. Because transfer related all decisions usually come from the top. So we will be discussing all dimensions related to the role of such organization through wonderful group of our panelists. Uh, we have Ravi Srinivasan as our chair and Dr. Maria as our moderator. Uh, Ravi Srinivasan is senior business journalist and columnist who is, uh, has huge experience or edit, as an editor with the Hindu business line. And we have Maria as a se our session moderator who is physician and doctor in public health. We have four panelists with us, Dr. Kayasi from WHO, uh, WHO's Department of uh, Health, Social Health, Sanjay Mitra, our former Secretary Murth, Tony Bliss, who will be joining online, who is the expert in road safety management from University of Melbourne, and Rakesh Mohan, who is an economist from Reserve Bank of India. Uh, I will invite Chair to open this session, and before that, I would just uh, would like to convey that uh, each, uh, pan uh, each panelist and moderator is supposed to talk for around 10 minutes, and after eight minutes, I will mirroring this. This is DM Sir's favorite one, so consider that as his order. So with this, I just hand over to Chair to initiate the, open the session. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it gives me a chance to enter the portals of the Indian Institute of Technology, which I quite never quite managed uh, after school. Um, in fact, I found the entrance exam paper so difficult that I gave up after the mathematics exam and went and saw movies and lied to my parents that I finished all the other papers. So thank you for that. It's a nice feeling. And uh, also thank you for uh, uh, actually according me a place on the stage with this very august panel. I am by no stretch of imagination an academic, uh, nor indeed an ex expert or, uh, on the issue of transportation. What I have done most of my life is to look at how this country works. Um, how it runs, uh, how the people who run it work, uh, what are the pushes and pulls that have sort of moved our very cacophonous uh, democracy uh, forward uh, over the years uh, with lots of diversions, uh, backpedaling, and uh, dead ends on the way. But nevertheless, we have moved, moved ahead. So if I have any sort of expertise, it's basically just looking at, at uh, how, how you know, our policy makers and administrators have, are either managing or not managing uh, to do what they're supposed to do. And that's really the role of the media, uh, just to hold up a light to this. It's for other people to actually take, take action on it. I get trolled all the time on Twitter saying, but why haven't you done anything about this, why do you keep criticizing and so on. But that's unfortunately neither my expertise nor my capability. Uh, <clears throat> on the issue today uh, about the role of uh, institutions, governance, um, uh, in the narrow context of uh, safety, traffic safety, um, I think India provides a textbook te example of failure of both these, uh, both institutional fa failure and governance failure. Uh, we have the highest number of uh, road uh, fatalities in the world. Um, it's uh, the number of road accident deaths are growing at a, a, approximately thrice the speed of the economy uh, at about twice the rate at which vehicles are being added to this. Uh, you know, added in the country to the roads, and uh, well, about the uh, speed at which we're adding road networks into this thing. So, uh, not only <coughs> not only is the trend upwards, it's getting increasingly more dangerous uh, just to be out on the streets in our country. Um, there is a long history of act acts of omission and commission which lie behind this. Um, I believe personally that one of the fundamental um, uh, root causes uh, um, lies in a sort of, it's a bias which uh, ad, uh, underlies all our policy making, which is uh, a hangover from the 
age of planned development, where <clears throat> we have tended to uh, prioritize output over, uh, if I may put it that way, outcomes. So we don't look at what, uh, what, what is the desired outcome, we just look at target certain levels of output. So uh, whether it is in the number of vehicles produced or the number of kilometers of roads, uh, but we don't look at output in the sense, are we actually managing to transport more people efficiently? Is the road network actually adding to uh, economic connectivity for the hinterland population? You know, are our roads safer? Uh, <coughs> Policy really doesn't address itself with those issues. Um, <clears throat> whatever little we have, uh, they don't work. Uh, uh, you know, because if they worked even a little bit well, we, we wouldn't have such a shockingly high level of accidents and uh, fatalities on our roads. And the failure is, you know, on part of all stakeholders here. You know, it would be unfair to just blame the government for this. Um, the automobile industry has had a large part to play by <coughs> lobbying to have unsafe vehicles on the road uh, for a long time, you know. And uh, by unsafe vehicles, it's not just the quality, but actually the basic safety requirements which are built into a vehicle which is allowed to ply on the roads, right? Uh, <coughs> I remember very well that for at least a decade or a decade and a half uh, um, of the time that I covered the automobile industry, seat belts were sold as an optional accessory in this country, as a luxury addition. Seat bags became mandatory only, I think, just a few years ago. So uh, the, uh, I, I remember running a campaign um, uh, when I was the editor of the Times of India in Pune, which is the hub of uh, India's largest two-wheeler manufacturing center. All the big manufacturers are there. And I ran a campaign saying, look, <clears throat> add, adding a crash helmet to your bike as part of the basic fittings when you sell it, you know, and I spoke to helmet manufacturers. At that time, the costs addition was just 150 rupees per unit vehicle sold. And they refused to absorb it. Absolutely refused to absorb it. They said, when the law changes, we will sell it. Otherwise, we're not going to do it. So that's the attitude. So all stakeholders are at play out here. Uh, you know, the other session, there were mentions about um, the role of, uh, uh, they say, we have some of the worst drivers in the world. Institutionally, we don't have any mechanisms for ensuring that people who are allowed to apply vehicles on the road are trained in basic safety techniques, you know. Um, and there is a failure down the line, you know, and, and you can argue about whether it's a central government's responsibility or the state government's responsibility, but, you know, across the board. So. That's a very depressing picture. Hopefully, you know, our panelists will come and, uh, uh, you know, um, throw more light on maybe the solutions we can come up with to improve this. So over to you, Maria. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm glad to report to you that, that you are going to witness the nth variation on how to combine a convenor, one chair, several panelists, and a moderator. Uh, that was the challenge you gave us. <laughs> um, I can only echo the gratitude for the opportunity to be here. And I will also express how privileged I feel to be listening to so many uh, intelligent, eloquent, and passionate individuals, all reminding so fondly uh, Dinesh Mohan. On the logistics, uh, you have being given a hint, there will be an angelical reminder when you are two minutes away from the time. But because we are surrounded by economies, we're going to apply the techniques. So here you have a little suite. It is yours to keep if you stick to the time. It will be removed from your table if you exceed, exceed it. Now it is yours. And we were told several times during these past days that punishment works better than carrots. So here you have the carrot. You risk losing it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. We can trade. <laughs> um, 
Um, uh, and having discussed on the logistics, I want to uh, echo your earlier comment that in this particular panel, we're really looking forward to talking about the elephant in the room, as per Peggy's words this morning. And with that said, the first one to discuss on the elephant is Meleki, a good friend and colleague who, on top of what has been said already, uh, has as his primary duty at WHO to facilitate the development, implementation, and evaluation of road safety programs in all countries around the world and to evaluate their effectiveness. He's our evidence guru. Go ahead, Meleki. The podium is yours. Yes, so I'm, I'm looking at the topic uh, going beyond risk factors and intervention. My conversation is around advancing road safety governance research. When I was an academic for 11 years, I looked forward to publishing in uh, high quality journals because I believed it was so crucial to disseminate my findings. I assumed that uh, policy makers, various people involved in organizations and implementation of transport, I'm a transport specialist, would spend the evening reading BMJ, uh, uh, accident analysis and prevention, and the, the other top journals. Then I joined the policy in WHO 2002, where for my first time I met Dinesh, I came through another experience whereby we invest time in producing guidelines and I actually visit and give guidance to countries and I discovered that uh, policy makers, presidents, ministers don't spend time reading BMJ, accident analysis and prevention. And I had to think again, how do you do this? As uh, Maria has said, I spent time looking at uh, the various resources in my area of work, producing guidance, as well as synthesizing a lot of literature. Maria has said it clearly that uh, this is my, one of my major responsibilities, to really be up to date so that uh, we can produce well-informed guidance. And again, I do it and I, I, I've come across a major challenge and I think it's been echoed here and is reflected in this question. Why are effective road safety solutions not being implemented as they should? There are several reasons that we can give, but since we started about uh, three days ago, there has been some reflection on this, and one of the factors that comes around is around institution, organizations, how things are organized in society, either in the road safety sector itself, in the transport sector, or in a country. And so as much as you may say either, you know, dissemination of the research findings is not adequate, you may feel the guidance, you may actually feel the frequent shift in government, five years, three years, we bought another government in, another one comes in, could be a major consideration. Uh, increasingly, what is coming out is that uh, there is an issue with governance. We've alluded to this, we talk about responsibility, sharing responsibility. We talk about political commitment. Very good words. We talk about accountability. And I'm just taking, he has given me permission. Ravi has said that uh, he has focused his effort, a lot of his working experience, in understanding how this country works. Uh, Maria has called it the elephant in the room. Uh, Ravi has also called it acts of commission and omissions, efficiency. In other words, there's a whole area of research which we are not conducting at the moment. This is the governance side. And this morning we started alluding to that. I know 
it's so good for us to analyze the risk factors, the prevalence, you know, alcohol impairment, speeding. These are very crucial the infrastructure. But after we produced all these results, what happened? So when I was young or kind of entered WHO, I used to have a very big suitcase <laughs> when going to the countries. <laughs> and to give technical support to member states. So that suitcase had uh, half of it had my clothes, the other half had technical documents. <laughs> and uh, you know, I thought there'll be a very rapid uptake of this. People will be excited, you know, give us this and we want to do this. But I again discovered that most of these are really lying on the shelf, shelves, either in the academic institutions or in the government departments or NGOs. And this has really challenged me. The production of knowledge is not enough. There's another whole system that translates this knowledge or fails to act on this knowledge. This is the elephant in the room that we need to understand. Oh, oh no, I'll save my chocolate. So, oh, sorry, I have to. So, so I've, I'm, I'm just citing, I've looked at several articles or journals. I think all of you are, fam I'm trying to save my chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all of you are familiar with Rune Elvik, 2009. It has 1,100 pages. I've had to even count. There are, um, for example, whether these are road safety agents. Uh, whether there is coordination, etc. So this is what I spent my time looking at. So whether you are looking at uh, Rune Elvik, uh, whether you are looking at the journal, I think the editors are here, uh, Injury Control and Safety Promotion, where you, whether you are looking at injury prevention, uh, transport reviews and safety lead, over 95% of all the articles here are on risk factors and intervention. You get very little on governance. How does the system work? Who has the power, the decision-making power? Who allocates money? This morning I was so impressed during the air pollution session. There's a study that I've analyzed to the spending, how, you know, exactly what is that money spent for. I think it's such a beautiful study. This is what I'm thinking about. And for some reason, those of us in road safety are not analyzing these issues. And this is what I'm pointing out. Why have we not invested time on analyzing governance? We talk about political will. You know, we have resolutions. We had a decade of action, but we didn't analyze how does this translate into action. I'll finish. I'm very, doing very well. So we have a few current building blocks. We have a small group of researchers and practitioners interested in this area. We have very extensive research that has gone on in the social sciences man management. We have Douglas North, Eleno Ostron, and Winnie Mitula, who is a very good governance researcher. And then there's a lot of interest in us understanding the political co economy context. And then we have a few young researchers who have come from political science that are working in road safety. And then there's some ongoing work by Girish. You remember the model he presented to us on Tuesday. We have Meleki here, Gitam. We have Winnie Mitula, Mother Hijra, and uh, Christine in Klan. There's another colleague from uh, Sweden and another one from the USA. So I've looked around the road safety community. There are very few people who are really doing research on governance. So my conclusion is trip. And all these collaborators should invest effort into advancing research, road safety governance research, which will be in line with Dinesh's vision and spirit of exploring, reaching out to new areas. And this will be a great honor to sustain his legacy. We can appoint a professor of road transport governance. We don't have such a professor. We are professors of epidemiology. But there's not even a senior research, senior research fellow in all these centers of excellence looking at 
road safety governance. How shall we advance this area when we don't have a leader, an academic leader? And I also suggest that uh, this small group, uh, there are about six or seven around the world. Please constitute yourself into a small working group so that you can define the scope and the research agenda for this. In short, let governance become a key research area in road safety. Thank you. For science to guide us into implementation, let's hear from implementers. And uh, next is Sanjay, who besides uh, having been a former secretary of the Ministry of Transport, um, uh, is still working within the ministry and is dealing with, uh, not anymore. No, no. Oh, then I, my, the past sense, <laughs> the tense wasn't correct. But his, um, his primary concern while in there was to make sure that the road safety issue was in the agenda. Good afternoon. Um, for some reason, Geetham and her team are refusing to recognize me as a, a colleague on the faculty. I used to be the Secretary of Road Transport, now I happen to be a professor here, but somehow Geetham is not happy. Uh, so, um, uh, we are here to, uh, in a symposium in the honor of Dinesh Mohan, and uh, if there is one contribution that he's made, which of course is still work in progress, it is the emphasis on lead agency, on the institutional structure of road safety. Uh, there's another person on the dais who was equally involved in proposing such a thing, but I'm afraid uh, Dinesh kind of, uh, he kind of uh, anticipated him. So um, I now, I also am a member of the Supreme Court Committee on Road Safety, uh, which actually follows up very uh, strongly on whatever uh, the recommendations of the Sundar Committee were, where uh, Dinesh Mohan played a very important role. So I'll rapidly go through, uh, I have about 20 odd slides, it's not very important. So the thing is that this is the road safety timeline. We began to put road safety on the agenda after the Sundar Committee report. When we started building the national highways, uh, you know, for some time nothing happened, as in when we built better national highways, the number of accidents went up very sharply. The data is quite obvious. So that's when about 2005-7, the idea came to the cabinet to set up a committee. The Sundar committee was set up. They gave a report. Um, uh, then there was a PIL, uh, a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court, where a series of orders were issued. And they set up the Supreme Court committee in 2014. It's been eight years now, and there has been some progress. I wish I could say that you know we managed to reverse the trend on road accidents and fatalities. Uh, we really haven't done so, but there is... Uh, to use a much abused phrase, which Professor Rakesh Mohan uses probably, is green shoots of economy, recovery. <laughs> so we then, maybe there are some green shoots, but uh, next please. So uh, Sundar committee had a very um, clear-cut kind of you know, um, charter, and they followed it, and they kind of um, went about in a very systematic manner. And they came to the conclusion that when you have sharp rise in the number of victims, fatalities, and they were mostly male in the most productive age, and there was no institutional structure, even though the Motor Vehicle Act, which one of the speakers has uh, had criticized substantially a couple of days ago, uh, had something called the National Road Safety Council, but it was there just in name. It met once a year and nothing much happened. So then there was this UN resolution, which again gave emphasis, gave emphasis to the idea of a lead agency, a body that will hold knowledge, the body that will push, the, put, push for the reform, the body will kind of look at the implementation status and basically run with it. Because road safety is uh, divided among so many agencies, the police, the transport department, the environment department, things like that. And it's very difficult to uh, come, uh, the public works department, the National Highways Authority, all kinds of people have a role in it. And it's important to have a lead agency. So these were the recommendations from the committee that there should be a law on road safety, and there should be a National Road Safety and Traffic Management Act, there should be a National a road safety agency, a board. There should be highway police and there should be higher penalties. Um, we've talked of the political and economic factors on road safety. They came to play on this issue and uh, kind of, um, the trickiest point was highway police. Uh, unfortunately, this is a federal country. Perfect solutions which exist in the mind of uh, my current profession, academics, is when you say that everything must flow normally, it doesn't happen. It got stuck on the police issue because federal, in the sense, India, police is a state subject. 
And when you say there will be a highway police, it's not a great idea. And what happens when the fellow falls off the highway? He goes to the state police. So they were, it really didn't fly because at that time, for those 10 years, India had a coalition government with a very strong state government present, where state governments and parties holding power in states had a huge things to say, so it really didn't go. There was virtually no progress on the legal amendment. Then this Supreme Court got into the act and said that we should strictly enforce you know, the law on enforcement, uh, strictly enforce the law, we should focus on engineering, we should focus on education and emergency care. And this committee was set up. So the committee's emphasis again was on lead agencies, where they basically took on uh, Professor Mohan's ideas. Lead agency with money, with empowerment, with staff, and with capability. The other things, uh, so these, uh, we, the, accordingly the uh, MB Act was amended. We didn't have a separate Road Safety Management Act because it's not politically feasible. Because uh, you know, then you have to get into all kinds of amending the list two of the Constitution, which in this country in a fraught environment is not exactly a great idea. So um, at that time, I happened to be the Secretary of Road Transport, realized it's not going anywhere. And we took upon what they call our sales tax model of set, and we set up a state committee of trans, committee of state transport ministers, which kind of took the idea forward, and we got a act going. It had higher penalties, indexed penalties, protection to Good Samaritans, higher compensation for hit and run, juvenile driving, insurance requirements. It got stuck again. It passed the Lok Sabha. It got stuck in the Rajya Sabha. The item two is very interesting. We had something saying that the vehicle can be just registered after purchase in the dealer's office. This upset the motor vehicle department a lot for reasons that I'll not elaborate. And it got held up for five years. And finally, 2019, three years. In 2019, this is passed. And state government's concerns have been taken on board. Supreme Court issued a further directive, very detailed directive, after which Justice Local retired and after which uh, the Supreme Court has been, you know. Um, so the Supreme Court Committee has been pushing for this, uh, these reforms in the last five, seven, eight years. Uh, in the states, the lead agencies existed only in name. The, the, they were not financially empowered, they had no permanent staff. So it has taken us a good five, six years to push on this issue. When the higher penalties were brought through, here I somehow I'm unable to appreciate this idea, you know, that you have to have higher penalties. If you want behavioral change, forgiving roads are not the answer. Sorry, Geetam. Uh, you have to have higher penalties, otherwise nobody's going to listen to you. You may not like the idea, but you know, I have kind of administered for a long time. If a guy knows he's going to get penalized and he's going to pay a lot of money, he's not going to, he or she is not going to break the rule. So in, we got stuck on higher penalties. State government after state government refused to notify higher penalties. And they just sat on it. And uh, finally, now they have kind of changed the penalty re regime. Um, we have to wait to wait and see um, what happens now in the coming years, years and how we kind of uh, go forward. Because uh, um, we are doing something called the road safety audit, where DIMPTS and IIT Delhi are also involved. We are working with states. Behavior continues to be a problem. Use of mobile phones, over speeding, wrong side driving, red light jumping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Engineering issues seem to play a role, particularly at intersections, where lower hierarchy roads run into higher, higher hierarchy roads. We seem to have a problem there. Anyway, thank you very much. I am very keen on my chocolate. Thank you. But I don't have anything more to say. We should have thought of the chocolate before <laughs> in the meeting. <laughs> Thanks for showing us the little elephants in each and every uh, effort that you that you try to put forth. I'm not sure that we have Tony Bliss online. Can we confirm that? Because we see his name, but we don't see his face. Hi, Tony. Are you there? I am here, Maria. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. We cannot see you, but we can still take your wonderful advice. Let me just introduce you more formally. Uh, Tony Bliss uh, is a well-known international expert who, uh, on top of a zillion other things, co-author the 2004 
first ever international report uh, on road safety that put together the United Nations, the World Bank, and a number of other uh, entities. And I don't mention specifically WHO because in here I'm including it as part of the UN uh, family. And a little bit later on, he co-authored with Jim Breen a World Bank report that has become like the master guideline on road safety management, uh, read and tried to be applied on <laughs> in every single country around. So, Tony, the floor is yours. I promise I will mail you the chocolate if you stay to the 10 minutes, please. Go ahead. That's great. I was going to ask you for that, Maria. Um, look, I'm sorry that I've only been able to join you right now. Um, I had other commitments during the week. Um, so I'm only joining you towards the end of this important symposium that's commemorating our brilliant colleague and friend, Tanish Mahan. I'm honoured to have this opportunity. Uh, it's hard being a, fa a voice and maybe a face coming from a screen and being unable to sense my audience and make that personal connection. So I've prepared some notes to get across the points I would like to make. Tanish is, is still very much with me and all of us. And I'm imagining a conversation that we would have about the role of institutions, organisations and governance in the context of unintentional injury prevention and the rich canvas of Tanisha's work and its impact, which has been addressed by the themes of this symposium. It's a complex and dynamic world that we're discussing and institutional, organisational and governance issues implicitly and explicitly saturate and underpin any conversation we can have. This gets us into the politics of such a conversation, an often uncomfortable territory where Dinesh played an active and vital role. It takes us to a place where Dinesh, ably aided and abetted by Peggy, was very much at home. Dinesh was always politically engaged, even in his most scientific moments. In, co in contributing to this conversation with Dinesh, I would make the following points. We need to place our focus on the realities being faced by low and middle income countries, noting that Denise was one of the most eminent and respected champions, while recognising that the lessons learned in addressing these realities can provide good practice direction to high income countries, a point often stressed by Denise. For the purposes of our conversation, we need to define what we mean by institutions, organisations and governance, which could take forever depending on the disciplinary stances adopted and the extent to which all related literature would be assessed. And I'm noting Maleki's point, there's not a, lot of a lot of, not a lot of literature in the road safety world, but there is an enormous amount of literature around this problem of institutions, organisations and governments. For our purposes, I suggest that we focus on the public sector and conflate institutions and organisations to talk just of institutions, which can also be seen as organisations, agencies, bureaus, commissions, etc., engaged in their safety planning, policy, regulatory and public goods provision roles. I would also suggest that we relate governance to the performance management arrangements focused on the desired safety results. In the road safety world, these arrangements are well defined, if not well delivered. We must also address the methodological challenges that have been raised as symposium themes to deal with the seeming invisibility and indirect nature of institutional impacts on safety outcomes. In dealing with the issue of invisibility, I would argue that we can identify, measure and manage essential institutional and related governance functions, which can take on different institutional forms. These functions are baked in at a strategic and operational level and integral to the effective, efficient and equitable delivery of good practice interventions. That is, we can render visible strategic management functions, what I've termed results focus, coordination, funding and resource allocation, promotion, monitoring and evaluation and research and development and knowledge transfer and related intervention dose metrics inputs and outputs that provide a comprehensive picture of the integral institutional and governance components of interventions delivered. We can note 
that the ongoing emphasis in the global road safety community of documenting and promoting the why and the what of road safety interventions in low and middle income countries has seemingly veiled or eclipsed the institutional and governance components of the how. And previous speakers have been talking of those issues. My central question to Dinesh in this conversation I'm imagining would be that perhaps we've missed what was really sitting behind and driving the ongoing success achieved in good practice countries since the vital scientific contribution made by William Haddon, who Dinesh worked with before returning to India in the latter half of the last century. Whether road safety interventions address safety priorities before the crash, during the crash, or after the crash, and whether they address the road user, the vehicle, or the road environment in good practice countries, they all embrace crucial institutional and governance dimensions. This has been vital to the success achieved, the success that we promote. Since the World Report of 2004, which has placed its top priorities on institutional and governance reforms, if you look closely at its recommendations, and for example, the Sunda Report of 2007, which embraced and developed these priorities, with Dinesh playing influential roles in both reports, perhaps we have been telling our colleagues in low and middle income countries the wrong story. Or more mildly, have we been telling them only part of the story? Have we been unduly focused on the why and the what, but essentially kept silent on the how? That is, have we submerged the important story of institutions and governance as critical success factors in the road safety production process in favour of promoting the surface effects, the responses of good practice interventions? Have we just dodged the difficult politics of digging more openly and deeply into what comp comprises effective, efficient and equitable doses of these interventions, especially in terms of their institutional and governance underpinnings? Have we also been avoiding the related 21st century implications of rapid urbanisation, new transport technology, climate change and democratic deficits? all of which require a rethinking and resetting of institutional and governance arrangements. In this conversation with Denise, our good, colleague, our good colleague and friend, I would be asking these questions and wondering if this is where we should be channeling our energy and commitment in the coming years. I would like to think that all of, those, all of us that are gathered here can carry on this conversation to refocus the global road safety debate that seems to have lost the energy, commitment, compassion and sharpness of mind that Dinesh contributed throughout his entire career. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. And I have to say that hearing your deep voice from above, it's like a godish experience. <laughs> and you got your chocolate, oh. by the way. <laughs> Um, thanks, thanks for uh, those uh, wonderful remarks, and, and we could all sense your emotion while going through your speech. Um, our last speaker uh, for now is uh, Rakesh, uh, whom I guess you all know well, as uh, it has been pointed out for his government role uh, quite a few years uh, back. But I wanted to highlight for this um, uh, session his leading role in this uh, Committee on Infrastructure structure that became, uh, created a landmark document in the evolution of thinking in economic policy issues. And on a more personal note, I think it's only important to highlight that he is actually Dinesh's uh, brother. So um, the floor and the chocolate for the time being are yours. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, if I may, I'll take two or three minutes extra uh, as preliminary remarks uh, on Dinesh, actually. First, uh, I want to thank uh, Geetam, Matthew, and all your colleagues in Ecorsi for organizing uh, this symposium in honor of my elder brother, Dinesh. Not just a brother, he's an elder brother. Um, a couple of personal remarks. Um, those people who have known both of us would know how different we've always been. Uh, but at the same time, 
I think that uh, we have always had the same objectives, the same uh, prim primarily very high sense of ethics, concern for fairness and equity, which I think we inherited from both our parents and our grandparents. And I have to say that he sort of served as my conscience in the many roles that I've had in government and otherwise uh, in uh, liberalizing the economy over the last uh, 32 years. Um, just before uh, I start the one, I, I want to give you one vignette from when he was about 10 or 11 years old. So I'm the only fellow who knows uh, that particular uh, vignette of his. So when he was around 10 or 11 years old, um, I would have been seven or eight years old at the time, our mother noticed in one particular period of seven to 15 days that he was just constantly falling off something, you know, like falling off a thing like this, but really falling off something all the time. So she asked him, what the hell is going on? Uh, why are you falling all the time? So his answer, his response was classic. He said he wanted to find out what kind of a fall would result in a fracture. He wanted to find out how that would feel. He wanted to find out how would that be cured. And uh, so his interest in science-based science and evidence-based research on injuries started very early in his life. Um, so you know, this is, he, he, I'm, I'm not making this up, by the way. It's <laughs> so um, it really I mean, it astounded all of us uh, at the time. But of course, his, his uh, uh, interest in safety didn't extend to, again, he was about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, I was three years younger. Our parents had gone off somewhere. So he says, let's take off in the car. He'd never driven the car. So I said, yeah, good idea. <laughs> So he, he gets behind the, and we had a large compound as it happened at that time. So he gets behind the car, and we drove about three, four hundred yards or something. So whereas he had a huge interest in uh, science-based, evidence-based research, but he never practiced safety. Uh, and since he never had a new car in his life, he never had an airbag in his car. Uh, so you know his practice was very different from his research. Okay, so much for that. Um, this, of course, has been a very wide-ranging uh, symposium in all aspects of this. It's a lifetime professional and personal interest from human rights to environment, public health, uh, urbanization, and almost all issues related to transport. Uh, I do hope that, Gita, I do hope that this will become an annual event uh, covering all these topics and perhaps new ones as they arise. And in some sense, get more centers like yours uh, set up in the country, which has to do with these institutions, uh, governance, and so on. So um, I've been assigned the job of uh, providing more reflection institutions, governance, organization. Of course, that, re that reflects the reality uh, while not possessing any expertise on the subjects of the conference. Um, what my remarks will uh, reflect today are uh, what I learned by chairing the National Transport Development Policy Committee his report is, as you can see in the image, is still available from Amazon. So you can go off and buy it. If you don't want to buy it, you uh, go on to my website, rakeshmohan.com, and you'll find some link somewhere uh, in, in, the, in the website. Um, the, this was the National Transport Development Policy Committee, appointed by then Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh in 2010. And we finally submitted a report in early 2014, just when he was going out of power. So no one has read it including Mr. Sanjay Mitra, whose three of his uh, predecessors were members of the committee. But he noticed in the, th in the sequence that he mentioned on the 2007 Sundar Committee, etc., he didn't mention this report, which had a complete chapter on safety uh, written by Dinesh, actually. And of course, it reflected what Sundar Committee had said. But that's how this is the institution governance issue, that you, can, that you can do a detailed report on the whole transport sector it had relevant fact chapters, full chapters, fully researched on safety, on research, on governance, institutions, urban transport. Um, and, but, but that's how, I mean, that sort of reflects uh, a governance as well. But let me start uh, with some numbers. As can be expected, uh, there are always problems in uh, reporting data on such issues. 
uh, because road accidents take all over, take place all over the country, it's very dispersed and decentralized reporting from different sources. So what I find is that there's, in the terms of the current or the last years or what two years back uh, data, there's a difference of about 100%. That is, the Ministry of Road Transport uh, reports about 150,000 in 2018, 2019, whereas WHO uh, Maleki reports about 300,000. So I don't know where they get their data. Uh, since I'm not an expert on the subject, I can say, look, it's somewhere between 150,000 and 300,000. Um, but what does it mean? Uh, it means about 400 to 800 road accident deaths in India every day, depending on what we believe. Um, Matthew showed in his, in, in his initial uh, uh, remarks in the, in the symposium that most, accident, most injuries and deaths occur outside the car. And therefore, it's not just the inside car safety, safety belts, airbags, et cetera, that are important for the country. And this is what Matthew emphasized the other day. Now, just compare this, say, 500, 600,000, that compare the 400 to 800,000 deaths a year with you know, the whole world has been, has, been, has been consumed with concern for COVID. Of course, COVID consumed Dinesh, so it's great concern to me, right? But that's about, in, in India, that's about 500, 600,000 deaths. I have not moved them yet. Oh. <laughs> um, the, the, um, so just, as I just come, you know, the whole world has been consumed by COVID. How many institutions, right, and so on. Now, as far as India is concerned, the number of annual official data on COVID deaths is comparable to road safety, de uh, road deaths every year. That is 400 to 800,000 compared to half a million to 600,000 COVID deaths. Of course, people say that COVID deaths are also underreported. Um, so, but the traffic death epidemic uh, carries on relentlessly. Hopefully, COVID will go one of these days. But there's nothing like similar concern. And I think this must be emphasized that look, this is an epidemic. There's nothing less than an epidemic. And other countries have really had an impact on the epidemic. But the story, of course, does not end here. Again, these are Dinesh's numbers. I'm really, you know, if you close your eyes, uh, you think Dinesh is speaking here. Um, because my voice is very similar to his. I'm reporting everything that he wrote in this chapter, which others have not read. Um, so, but the story doesn't end here. That there are around 20 times serious injuries from every traffic, per every traffic fatality, requiring hospitalization and around three times injuries resulting in permanent disabilities. Um, and so if there are 150 to 300,000 deaths a year, then about 450,000 to a million people suffering permanent disabilities every year. And since unfortunately our daughter had a, uh, a an terrible accident 12 years ago, we know what this means in terms of permanent disability. So, this, so the, all, all I'm trying to say is through these numbers that um, uh, that the, the uh, importance of this must be understood. Now, one thing that is encouraging, by the way, is that from the officially reported data, there is, does seem to be a plateauing in India since around 2015 or so, 20 or thereabouts. I'm, again, I'm not an expert on these data, but there does seem to be a plateauing. And I think it's worth researching on why this plateauing has occurred despite many more cars, uh, higher speeds, highways, and everything. So something must have been done, which I don't know what it was. Um, I wish, uh, by the way, I wish Mr. Punawala was uh, aware of this, and he could invent and make a vaccination, just that he's done for COVID, for road traffic safety also. Um, but, and, the, and, and that's not a joke in the sense that what kind of vaccination is required for road traffic safety? Um, it is basically to do with the importance of institutions, organizations, and governance. And other countries' experiences provide us a great lessons on how we can really indeed vaccinate ourselves against traffic accidents uh, because of the, uh, with the institutions that can be, that can be devised. Um, something that all of you know, but I'll just repeat for the record in a sense, the evolution of thinking on traffic safety, on road safety, as I have understood it, mainly from Dinesh, and it's all out there in the chapter that we have, that 
Um, there's been a great change over the last 50 years which hasn't really come to India as yet, including, I think, some remarks in this symposium, which is that uh, the thinking on the road safety causes of accidents, what can be done about it? The paradigm has changed from hum emphasis on human error and behavior, causing accidents and fatalities, um, and such a view laid emphasis on accidents being blamed on faulty driving, carelessness for pedestrians, cyclists and other road users. And in reading about accidents media in India, Ravi, um, such reasoning uh, continues to dominant narrative in the media. Uh, if only we could be more disciplined, if you could obey rules, if pedestrians did not jaywalk, if accidents and injuries would be reduced. But what does such a behavior, does a view lead to in terms of solutions? Behavioral changes, education of road users, greater punishment of violators, etc and a view that there is really no solution. The paradigm, as I understand it, in change that is, in thinking that has taken place, takes for granted that humans will be humans, they will be careless, they will be drunk, they will not obey rules, and so on. So what needs to be done is to make systematic design changes that recognize that accidents will happen regardless of behavioral change in education, and our job is to minimize the consequences in terms of injuries and fatalities. And again, this is where governance, institutions, and institutions come in. Um, what is needed here is really a system view that addresses a whole host of issues, which was covered by Matthew in the first day, Geetam, Kavi Bhalla, and others. And you know, better design of roads, better signage, better vehicle design, better road service, legal institution frameworks, and so on. But how is this to be done? Um, transport safety management must move from action based on experience institutions, judgment, tradition, to one based on scientific research, empirical evidence like falling off things to fracture yourself, analysis, uh, and Dinesh's whole life work was devoted to this overall approach. And this needs institutions. So um, successful countries uh, set up institutional mechanisms over a few decades, and results be uh, became evident starting in the 1970s. Um, this was many, many years of capacity building, institution building, knowledge production, capability through research and development, and coordination among government departments. And the latter issue, that the coordination of government departments, I think, as Mr. Mitra mentioned, is really very difficult in India because of proliferation of ministries, agencies dealing with transport at the central level, and the reproduction in 28 states and union territories. The transport committee that I had the privilege of heading had secretaries representing six ministries and four others representing transport using ministries. So I had 10 secretaries of ministries in this committee. And this is doing a committee. So you, know, you can imagine how complicated it is to actually set up a nodal agency or a lead agency, uh, which still has, needs to be set up, but it's much, much more complicated here. We have the central level, multiply that by 28 states. So it's, it's a Herculean task, but it has to be still done. What have other countries done? All those structures of such agencies differ across many across countries, depending on their respective governance standards from federal governance and uh, standards and structures from federal to unitary countries and so on. What is indeed common is of successful countries in this is setting up lead agencies, which was what Maria mentioned uh, right in the beginning. Uh, for example, the National Traffic Highway Transport, National Highway Transport Safety Administration, housed in the Department of Transport of the United States, has as its mission statement, I think a very good, simple mission statement, to save lives, prevent injuries, reduce economic costs due to road accidents, uh, road traffic crashes through education, research, safety standards, and enforcement. This is a very simple statement, uh, but sums up what I think any such agency should try, strive to do. Its annual budget is around a billion dollars, and about 15% of that is devoted to research. And it has about 600 staff spread across its central office in Washington, D.C., and across states. And there are similar institutions uh, um, in almost all OECD countries and increasingly in emerging market countries. So let's look at the budget for a second for in, from India's point of view. A uh, billion dollars is about 8,000 crores. Over five years, this would amount to 40,000 crores. Obviously, A, we can't afford that. B, we pay much less. You know, we pay, don't pay ourselves very much. So 
uh, particularly in government. Uh, so, um, um, so, but even if you just take the 40,000 crores, that is a billion dollars a year, it will come to about 200,000 crores, I'm sorry, it's about 40,000 crores over five years. Just put this in perspective, that at present, the government has set up a production-linked incentive scheme over the next five years to give subsidies to industry to produce. How much is that? 200,000 crores. So obviously, we can afford it. They're going to give money to industry to produce in addition to whatever revenues they get. So this is not a Herculean task. However, taking account of our costs, you reduce that by a factor of four. That's 2,000 crores uh, over, over, over four year, five years. Um, now, road, the, the effectiveness of this can be seen from this. Uh, road traffic fatalities, I'll give a few chocolates to you, don't worry. Uh, uh, road, 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 traffic, uh, road traffic fatalities did reduce from 16, around 16,000 in Japan to the 19, in the 1970s to about 5,000 in 2016. From 3,300 to about 600 in the Netherlands over the same period, 8,000 to 2,000 in the UK, and 55,000 to 30,000 in the US over the same period. So the human and economic benefits from such expenditures are huge. So my point here, Maria, is that, no, we said, no, nothing, nothing was too difficult. The point is not that difficult. I think that this is the message I want to give. People say, no, you can't, you can't do it. You can do it. We've done lots of things in this country uh, which have changed life, our life, whether in the 50s, 60s, 90s, we've done lots of things. We can do it. This is not very difficult. You just have to set up an agency. Uh, yes, of course, I understand Mr. Mitra, what he said was absolutely correct. He's not easy, that governance is not easy to do. Once you put your mind to it, you can do it. After all, we've set up in the capital market, where I was involved, you set up Securities Exchange Board of India. It didn't exist before 1996. It's now a very respected agency. It has a huge effect on the working of the capital market. And then the Telecom Regulatory Authority, huge telecom revolution in the country. So we can do these things if you really put your mind to it. So what do we do, the way forward? Uh, the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways is, is the nodal ministry for road traffic safety. It has set up a National Road Safety Council with representation of ministers from transport related ministries, state governments, and other officials and non-official members. But it does not have a statutory status. It has all very, almost no budgetary resources. Am I right on that, uh, Sanjay? There's almost no budgetary resources. Uh, and no, certainly no professional expertise or a mandate for it to be effective. Uh, so what is needed is the setting up of national safety boards for roads, railways, water, and air transport alike. Uh, at, I'm only talking road safety today. There is a commission on railway safety. Somehow, I've never understood this, that the commission for railway safety is housed in the Ministry of Civil Aviation. I know, the, I know it's deliberate, but I think railways will fly or, uh, or, the, or that the aircraft will go on the rails. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, that it should be independent railways, I understand, but why in civil aviation, I don't understand. Um, maybe you can tell us why uh, after I finish. Um, so uh, so what, what would uh, constitute a National Rail Safety and Traffic Management Board? As Mr. Mitra said, uh, it has been recommended by a number of committees, first by the Sundar Committee in 2007, uh, headed by Mr. Sundar, and Dinesh was a member of that repeated by the, the National Transport Development Policy Committee in 2014, of which also Mr. Sundar was a member. So uh, as a consequence, finally, in 2020, October 2021, the government has indeed announced a National Road Safety Board. But I'm not able to find any details yet. Uh, I don't know whether they are. I looked for it, but I couldn't find them. But October 21, they have announced a National uh, Road Transport Safety Board. Um, so. Now, now that such an announcement has been made, it will be useful to delineate what it should look like and what it should do. So, Geetam, I think that since this has been done, you should, among with all your colleagues, really put in a concrete proposal on what this should contain, since the thing has been actually announced now. Um, it must not just be a committee. It should be set up as an independent organization with adequate budget and mandate. Most important, it should be an expert organization with technical and domain professionals in all areas related to road safety. It should aim to assemble at least 250 to 300 professionals over a period of three years. Again, this can be done. Look, IT companies hire 100,000 IT fellows every year, 100,000 plus every year. You can clearly assemble 250 to 300 if you want to do it. 
there's no problem. The hundred, you know, IIT is producing so many professionals, and now IITs are proliferated, so th there's no problem at all if you really want to do it. Um, and as it assembles its expertise, it should then provide directions on road-related measures, uh, the kind of thing Geetam talked about the first day, vehicle-related vehicle -related design standards, advice on safety related to traffic laws, capacity building related to uh, reference to police, highways, uh, highway authorities, medical care and rehabilitation, with all the problems that Mr. 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 Mitra mentioned, coordination with states, and from this, or this group's point of view, setting up multidisciplinary safety research centers. Um, uh, sorry, capacity building, setting multidisciplinary safety research centers in, in academic uh, institutions. And as I said, this is not just a pipe dream. Uh, also set up uh, institutions at state and city levels. Uh, we have the advantage of being latecomers to the scene, and scientific research uh, standards, designs are readily available to be adapted to our needs. Our professional expertise will have to be built up, uh, and as I said, with the vast expansion of technical education in the country in the last 20 years, this is not so difficult. 20 years ago, yes, it would have been difficult, but now it can. Um, there are many other institutions. Uh, if we, uh, well, just to take the COVID example, I end with this, that if we can, if this country, we can set up systems to actually deliver two billion vaccinations within 18 months or less, across the length and breadth of this country, with a higher proportion of people having been double vaccinated than in the United States and most uh, European countries as well. So there's no reason why we can't do this. And again, go back to the number of fatalities, the injuries, permanent disabilities. This is far more important than COVID. Uh, there are many other institutions and organizations concerned with transport that I could talk about, but I don't think Maria will let me, so I won't, and I'll stop here. Uh, the best memorial to my brother's life work can be that this symposium resolves to launch a safety revolution in India by promoting such institution building, capacity building, and to make this an annual exercise until you have results. If you can do that, then I can.